eight years later, the Switch is finally getting a real hardware upgrade. Better screen, better chip, better almost everything. But what about when you come to fix the thing? Our teardown has us asking, after all this time, is this really the best Nintendo could do? And don't get me wrong, the Switch 2 is a massive upgrade over the original Switch. The processor is about three times as fast as the original. It's got three times more RAM upgraded from LPDDR4 to LPDDR5X and a huge boost to storage from 32 gigabytes of eMMC to 256 gigabytes of significantly faster UFS 3.1. That doesn't make it the most powerful hardware on the market though. It's still beaten by all of its major competitors, including the massively popular Steam Deck. But on the Switch 2, you do get Mario Kart and that's pretty much all that matters except for maybe repairability. I need to know how long I can keep a $450 device running before I rush out to spend my hard-earned cash on it. So let's get this thing open and take a peek inside. Here we go! Nintendo says the new Switch 2 Joy-Cons are better, but did they fix drift? The Joy-Cons have what appears to be an obvious entry point, two of Nintendo's signature tri-point screws, but remove those and you're still stuck. The back cover wants to come away, but it won't quite budge. Turns out the panel running across the central seam is glued on and needs to be pried out. Underneath that, we've got a few more screws. Hidden screws are fun. And by fun, I mean they turn your first time repairing something into a puzzle. But that does release the back cover and I can get into the Joy-Con proper. The 1.95 watt hour battery is front and center and can be disconnected immediately. Easy to disconnect, but to pry it out, I need the help of a pick and some isopropyl alcohol. I want the battery tray out next, and it's not obvious how to remove the trigger that's holding things down. After consulting with three other teardown engineers and a host of worthies, it turns out the trigger will pop out with a little bit of pressure. Not obvious, but easy. That opens up access to the screws underneath and allows me to remove the battery tray. Next up, I'm setting my sights on the sticks. Old Joy-Con joysticks, like most modern joysticks, use a potentiometer to read the voltage at a wiper that slides across a strip of resistive material. That material wears down over time, or plastic and dust can dirty the sensors. We've covered this in a few videos before. Stick drift has been a huge problem with other Switch models. One survey found that 40% of Switch owners had problems with their Joy-Cons drifting, and things didn't get any better with the Lite or OLED editions. After a bunch of lawsuits, Nintendo's president even admitted it and apologized, setting up a free repair program for North American customers. There are low-tech fixes for some kinds of Joy-Con drift. Sometimes cleaning the contacts helps, sometimes putting a little square of paper under the sensor will solve it for a while. But the best answer is to replace them with less drifty joystick tech that relies on magnets instead of potentiometers, such as Hall Effect or tunneling magneto-resistance sensors. Nintendo confirmed back in April that they wouldn't be using Hall Effect sensors in these sticks, which makes sense because the new magnetic attachment mechanism would interfere. But that wouldn't stop them from going with TMR, which is less susceptible to magnetic interference. But whatever tech they use, joysticks are high-wear components, which makes them high priority for repairability. There's a trick to getting the sticks out without removing the mainboard. After releasing the flex cable and removing the two screws, I need to flip the controller to its other side and unscrew the thumb grip. It's stiff, it doesn't want to move, but it does pop away. The jury is still out on whether this might damage your thumbstick, so don't do this unless you have to. Turning the Joy-Con back over, I can unclip the housing from the orange bracket underneath the mainboard and release the stick. Opening up the housing and, drumroll please, nope, no TMR, just the same problem we've had since 2017. Joysticks using the same drift-prone potentiometer tech as always, as far as we can tell at least. Maybe there's a more durable material in the tracks or something else we can't see, but we haven't yet met a potentiometer-based stick that's drift-resistant. Solution? Wait for Ghoulie Kit to release drift-resistant TMR replacements. The rest of the controller disassembly is pretty standard. The main highlight is probably the optical assembly that enables the mouse-like features in each of the controllers. It works on the same principle as your average optical mouse, with an infrared light emitter and a sensor detecting reflected light from a surface. Note the SR and SL buttons are metallic too. The magnetic attachment mechanism in the Switch 2 controllers needs these metal points to attach to the body. Both the steel buttons and the magnets are very high density and stand out prominently in CTs. After my Joy-Con disassembly, I'm suspicious of the rather obvious screws proclaiming an easy and hassle-free entry into the main console. There are two tri-point screws and three Phillips screws in total. Sure enough, that's not all. Hiding inside the Joy-Con attachment wells are two more screws that are well hidden underneath stickers, something we can clearly see in our CT scans. To get to those screws, we need to remove these stickers, which are more of a pain than they should be. 
With some heat and a pick, we can peel them back, but without at least a hairdryer to soften that adhesive, you're gonna struggle a bit. Peeling back the stickers reveals the magnets and four screws, of which we only need to remove the two outermost screws. Sending a couple of picks each side of the device and all the way around unclips the back panel from the main body. And finally, we're in. The three antennas and the coax cables running across the middle of the device are the obvious first steps. Two of the antennas are on spring contacts and one is physically attached to a coax. I can go ahead and remove a securing bracket and the micro SD express reader can be disconnected at this point, after which I can remove the five screws holding the shield and I can gently pry that away too. There's a good bit of clay colored thermal gunk under here, but now I have access to the battery, which I'll go ahead and disconnect. Battery removal turns to be an absolute mission. Lots of prying and lots of alcohol, and this thing won't budge. The isopropyl and a whole set of pry tools finally gets me through, but the foam glued to the battery has basically disintegrated. Just as bad as the original switch and just as bad as the Steam Deck. The Switch 2 has a 19.74 watt hour lithium ion battery, which seems like a nice upgrade over the original Switch, which was rated for 15.95 watt hours. But according to Nintendo's official specs, the Switch 1 and OLED models both would last about 4.5 to 9 hours of gameplay. Right out of the box, the Switch 2 has just 2 to 6.5 hours of gameplay. This is probably thanks to its upgraded hardware like its new Tegra SoC and 120Hz LCD. It also means that when the battery starts to age, you're going to feel it. Batteries are consumables, which makes them a major concern for repairability. Generally speaking, you'll get about 3 to 500 cycles out of a battery before it permanently reduces its capacitance to about 80% of its original value. This copper heat pipe is calling to me. Some screws and a bit of prying releases the thermal paste adhering the copper to the shield underneath it. I'm going to go around the board and start disconnecting these flex cables, starting with a microphone running the height of the device. The headphone jack is a pretty easy target, and like the micro SD card reader and microphone I just removed, it's a single component module which is great news for repairability. The fan is just as easily accessible, held in place by three screws sitting on rubber grommets that help to mitigate any noise from the fan. The two speakers are next. These are pretty easily accessible too, connected to the mainboard by JST-style connectors. There are a couple of flex cables and six screws left. Then again, we need to inch the board out bit by bit because of some thermal putty on the other side adhering the board to the frame. Removing one of the shields reveals the SoC sitting underneath it. This is the NVIDIA Tegra SoC with an octa-core ARM Cortex-A78 C CPU and a 12SM Ampere GPU supporting DLSS and ray tracing. Right next to the SoC we can find two micron flash storage modules, presumably each 128GB UFS 3.1 modules. We'll have a full chip ID out soon. At the top of the main board, we've also got the game card reader, which unfortunately you won't be able to replace. It was modular in the original Switch and Switch OLED, but is now soldered down onto the main board similar to the layout in the Switch Lite. There's not an awful lot else to see in here, so let's turn our attention to that LCD panel. It was a bit tricky getting the edge of the screen to lift, but that was mainly due to the lack of structural integrity in the frame with all the components removed. Once I had an opening, it was easy picking. The LCD panel is a larger 7.9 inch LCD touchscreen with 1080p resolution, HDR support, and a 120Hz refresh rate in handheld mode. No OLED here yet, but we'd be surprised if a light and an OLED model didn't show up at some point over the next few years. Nintendo has warned customers not to take off the plastic anti-shatter film, which Zack Nelson over at Jerry Rig Everything proved as very easily scratched. The film is not as noticeable as I thought it might be, but you'll sure notice it if you scratch it, so Nintendo had better offer replacement film. Last but not least, I want to take a look at the male component of the Joy-Con connector. 
Every connector has a defined number of mating cycles and it's good to know that it's a relatively easy component to remove and replace. So where does the Switch 2 land repairability wise? We would have hoped that Nintendo would have learned their lesson from being forced to offer a free Joy-Con repair program and they would have designed the Switch 2 to be more repairable from the ground up. The battery is glued in with powerful adhesive. Speaking of adhesive, there are stickers everywhere, hiding screws and getting in the way of important components. The joysticks are harder to get out than in the original Switch, even though we don't have reason to believe they'll be any more durable, and both USB-C charge ports and the primary storage are soldered to the main board. It's not all bad. Replacing the fan isn't too hard and the buttons are mostly soldered to break out boards that you could replace independently if need be. But all repairs rely on the availability of spare parts, and Nintendo has yet to release any parts or manuals for the original series of Switch devices, and there's no indication that they're going to do so for the Switch 2, even though New York's right to repair bill seems to require that they do so. If you cannot find parts for your repair, pass on the complaint to our friends over at repair.org and they will pass it on to the Attorney General. Based on all that, we're giving the Switch 2 a repairability score of 3 out of 10, meaning we can't recommend most repairs unless you're pretty experienced. Nintendo, you've still got some work to do. 